Welcome to Detective Fiction. This is part of the third year core course of the English Literature degree program at the University of Greenwich. My name is Professor Andrew King. I'll be posting online a series of videos on YouTube, each aiming to be about 20 minutes long, that I hope will help you get as much as possible out of the course. The videos are not intended to operate as substitutes for the lectures and seminars, but as supplements to them. As you'll find, the videos are much more detailed than the lectures, but there is also a lot of content and, above all, interaction in the lectures and seminars than is possible in these videos. I also hope that members of the public might get something out of them too, even if they aren't following the course as such. As I'll be insisting, many of the things we associate with detective fiction and the reading of clues apply not only to other kinds of texts, but to real life as well. The three questions that you see on the screen in front of you are ones that underlie the entire course. I won't always return to them explicitly because we'll operate at a less deep level uh, usually than uh, these. Uh, but nonetheless, they do underlie the entire course. I've already addressed to some extent why detection matters, and I've suggested already that it's a life skill that we all need. I think it's very dangerous to read entirely innocently and literally. Um, people can really e very easily, by those means, pull the wool over our eyes. And uh, I need hardly tell you that that's a very uh, risky situation to be in. But besides that very general approach to why detection matters, we will be looking more specifically at this genre of detective fiction, or at least certain aspects of it. It's such a huge genre, we can only cover a limited number of texts and a limited area of the whole genre, in fact. But I want to address here a fundamental question, which is that middle one. What is the fiction of detection? This raises, for me, ethical issues. Now, the idea of detective fiction as a genre is that everything's solved at the end, at least until we get to uh, postmodern detective fiction. The problems are solved, society is purified, uh, the crimes are appropriately punished. That's the classical form. That is, of course, a fictional form. That is definitely a fantasy. In real life, that does not happen. Sometimes it does, but very often it doesn't. The fiction of detection is the implication that we can, through following a series of clues, come to a total picture of reality. I don't think it will surprise you if I suggest that that's not possible. But we, it's a very tempting uh, fantasy and we're very susceptible to that fantasy. There are ethical issues involved in how we decode and assemble the various clues that we're presented with. Um, and that's what we're going to be focusing on again and again. I may never again refer to the fiction of detection but it's precisely the ethical issues involved in detection that I am referring to here. In particular, we'll be looking again and again at the relationship between law and justice. Before we go any further, of course, I should remind you of what the set texts are for uh, this uh, course. Uh, this lecture is particularly concerned with Edgar Allan Poe's The Murders in the Rue Morgue and The Pit and the Pendulum. But I won't actually be talking that much about them. I'll be thinking about much more general issues about detection in general. Of course I will be mentioning them, but not uh, very much indeed. Similarly, with the rest of the lectures, I'm not going to be giving you plot summaries. I'm assuming you've read the texts yourselves. Um, what I will be doing is commenting 
on the text rather than just describing them. I'll be thinking about ways of reading them. I'll be making various kinds of connections uh, with contexts uh, to enable you uh, to read these texts. There's a variety of uh, detectives uh, in the uh, course. We have, for example, in Mary Braddon's Henry Dunbar, an amateur woman detective, as well as a professional male one. In lecture four, with uh, the Sherlock Holmes, obviously, uh, which picks up from the uh, Dupin and unnamed narrator of the murders in the Rue Morgue, uh, in the Sherlock Holmes, you've got a male detective, but in The Adventures of Judith Lee by Richard Marsh, you've got a woman detective from uh, short, about two decades after the Sherlock Holmes were written. Matched is a wonderful parallel to a scandal in Bohemia. Very, very funny, in fact. With Raymond Chandler's The Lady in the Lake, we return to a hard-boiled male detective. Is he as hard-boiled as he appears? And then in the P.D. James, an unsuitable job for a woman, we've got Cordelia Gray's, the Cordelia Gray, the woman detective who only appears in um, a couple of uh, her novels, in fact. Very interesting. Though P.D. James in this novel suggests, it seems, that detection is a suitable job for a woman, one wonders whether she really thought that was the case. And finally, we bring the course right up to date with Kate Summerscale's 2016 uh, text, The Wicked Boy. Who's the detective here? Well, there are male detectives and a lot of suspicious women as well. But I'm going to be wondering who the real detective is in that text. Is it us? Is it Kate Summerscale herself? Is it the narrator? Well, we'll be thinking and reading suspiciously uh, all of these texts, uh, answering these questions, and indeed asking a lot more and providing a lot of different answers as well. Now, after those introductory slides, I want to pass now on to the lecture proper. These six words that you see before you and the key terms um, are fundamental. I'm not going to be defining them in what follows, but I want you to take note of them. Text, time, detection, archive, game, and reader. I want us to be thinking not about the definitions of the individual words, but about the interrelationships of these six terms. What is the relationship between text and time and detection, for example? Can we read a text without thinking about time? Can we detect clues without reference to an archive of material that we already know? And can we detect things simply as a game, or is detection something more serious? But these are just some of the ways that these uh, terms can be connected that I'll be exploring in what follows. What I really want you to do is to be alert to them as they recur again and again in what follows, and their way that they're recombined again and again in different ways, so that the meaning of each changes. To start the lecture proper then, on Poe reading and detection, I want us to think about a very key issue. What's a di difficult text? Now, this is a question that um, Britta Martins proposed in her very interesting uh, linkage of the rise of the dramatic monologue and detective fiction at much the same time. And she says, when we're reading a dramatic monologue, we have to read suspiciously. The narrator of the dramatic monologue um, uh, in Tennyson and Browning, for example, 
we have to be suspicious of the narrator. Are we being told the truth? And this is part of the interest of the dramatic monologue, uh, indeed. Is it off-putting, though? That's the question for us. I think a lot of us are put off by what we think of as difficult texts. Now, detective fiction is not generally considered a difficult genre. We're not talking about James Joyce's Ulysses or Finnegan's Wake here. Rather, we're talking about mass market, popular fiction, indeed. But maybe decoding applies as much to difficult texts as a the, as a as to detective fiction. There's always a difficulty of decoding at the heart of detection. And I wonder, maybe it's a question of how difficulty is presented to us. That's the big issue here. Is difficulty a class divider? Mm. This is a big question. Maybe it's a difficult text or a difficulty can only be resolved by the super educated. This is, in fact, what Poe suggests. You need a genius, really, uh, to sort out uh, a crime, such as the murders in the Rue Morgue. And it's Dupin who is uh, the genius who's enabled to do that. He's the aristocratic genius uh, who's not like us ordinary mortals. The narrator of the murders in the Rue Morgue is a link between the genius and the ordinary reader like us. How is this class situation presented in detective fiction? Hmm. An interesting question here. For Dupin, and indeed for the narrator of the murders in the Rue Morgue, detection is a kind of puzzle. It's a game. It's a game of drafts rather than chess. But that philosophical introduction to the murders of the Rue Morgue is also an encouragement for us to think about how we ourselves read. How do we decode text? How do we decode the world, in fact? Detective fiction, I really would argue this quite strongly, trickier than we might think, but it's sold to us, and we read it with, well, you know, with great joy as a metacognitive reflection. Uh, it's a thinking about how we think. A reflection, maybe a mirror reflection, or maybe an encouragement for us to reflect on what's being reflected to us, uh, it's a reflection about thinking, about our own thinking. And, of course, it's fundamentally metatextual. Detective fiction can certainly be regarded as a text about texts, a, a way of thinking about a reflection on, a consideration of how texts work, a reflection on textuality itself. That's what detective fiction as metatextual really means. We're not just talking about that philosophical introduction, which is very famous, by the way, to the murders in the room all, but all the detective fiction set on this course. We can read it as a way of thinking about thinking. And indeed, let's begin at the very beginning the murders in the Rue Morgue. Do you want to read that passage for a minute? And then move on to the next slide. You'll notice here that I've emphasised two words, the analyst and what the analyst does, disentangles. That implies that life is a real confusing tangle. And it's the analyst we need, this special person, the analyst, to disentangle the complications of life. I need hardly remind you, too, of the heavy masculine gendering of the analyst. There's no way in this story that there can be a 
female analyst, there's only a masculine one. And what does that analyst disentangling life do? Well, he has fun. He derives pleasure from it. And he doesn't only derive pleasure from the complications of high culture, but the most trivial things, the most trivial occupations, whatever they are, that enable him to exercise his brains, his powers of analysis, his talents, in other words. As you see, the analyst is fond of enigmas, conundrums, and hieroglyphics. Uh, enigmas, of course, rather like fun. Interesting that enigmas, conundrums, and hieroglyphics uh, are referred to rather than secrets or mysteries. Uh, much heftier terms, in fact, those than enigmas and conundrums, which were kind of printed puzzles, in fact, at the time. Hieroglyphics uh, is an interesting term in this context as well. Uh, the Rosetta Stone had been discovered in 1799 by Napoleon's troops when they invaded Egypt. Uh, and it was through the Rosetta Stone that uh, the Frenchman Jean-François Champollion uh, had uh, been able to uh, at least go some way to decoding hieroglyphics. Uh, in uh, 1822. And in Paris, of course, where the murders in the Rue Morgue take place, in Paris, there is a huge industry of uh, material, of the production of material, on uh, e e decoding Egyptian hieroglyphics in the 20 years after Champollion's uh, piece in 1822. That is, in the two decades preceding the publication of the murders of the Rue Morgue in April 1841. Funnily enough, hieroglyphics then comes across as a topical reference rather than as a generic one, a topical reference to something that's happening in the news. Now, just as Champollion decoded Egyptian writing, by following a certain investigative procedure, a certain series of steps, one after another, or at least that's the illusion he gave. There is a method in detective investigation as well. There is a narrative structure. First one thing, then another, then something afterwards. Accident may emerge. There may be lent to the procedure the whole air of intuition, but in fact, deep down, there will be an ordered series of scientific steps. And it's this ordered series of scientific steps which exist in a precise relation to time, one after another after another, that we call method. Method gives us access, in theory, to reality. Now, Poe assumes that in scientific analysis, the analyst must remain completely separate from what he, and of course the term is very gendered for Poe, from what he, the analyst, is analysing. In detection, however, that's not the case. Really successful detection involves the analyst becoming, in some sense, the opponent, becoming the object of a detection. The detective has to become, in some sense, the criminal. And it's through this act of imagination crossing borders between, if you like, the good and the bad, if you want to think in those terms, that the resolution of the story will be arrived at, that the mystery will be revealed, that the criminal may be tricked into error or rushed into making a mistake. Well, 
that's the end of the introduction to the introduction to this uh, first section on detective fiction. It's time now to move on to part two of three, where I'll be looking at the six key terms that will recur again and again throughout this course. Text, time, detection, archive, the game, and the reader. Part three, which will follow part two, obviously, will think about what the relationship between these terms actually might be.